Welcome back to another episode of Catastrophe and Cartography. In today's video, we'll be using Google Earth Pro's historical imagery tool, which will allow us to view satellite data going back roughly 40 years. And our focus will be on the various sand dunes found across the planet, because this is something I've been fascinated with for the past two months. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to talk with Randall Carlson over on his YouTube channel. In that video, Randall and I looked at some intriguing evidence for megascale floods in the Sahara. And, as expected, a lot of people commented that the features we were looking at were created by wind, not water. Of course, wind does make a lot of sense. Anybody who's been out hiking in the sand dunes can tell you just how quickly that sand can shift all around you. And I still remember plenty of times when I was hiking out in the great sand dunes where I was just getting sandblasted the entire time. So clearly, wind does have a big effect on how these sand dunes change over time. However, I think the role of water has been overlooked, and that's what we're going to focus on in today's video. So our main question today is, how do these sand dunes form? Are they created by wind, water, or both? Before we go any further, I should mention that all the documents and photos I reference in today's video will be available for download. Just check the description below for those links. We'll start off today in the channeled scablands of eastern Washington, which is an area that we know was ravaged by megascale floods as recently as about 10,000 years ago. This will clearly show us what a flooded landscape looks like. And if you're not familiar with the scablands yet, I'd recommend you check out the first video in this series where I explain how they were formed. Anyway, based on my research, it appears that eastern Washington has been pretty dry for most of the Holocene, or the last 10,000 years. And if the climate has been more or less a desert for that long, with fairly minimal rainfall, then that would mean erosion has been fairly limited as well, because a desert tends to preserve landscapes due to the lack of precipitation. With that said, sand dunes will actually shift more in hot, dry climates. And as it says here in this article, periods of drought will cause sand dunes to migrate more, due to the lack of vegetation and other stabilizing features. In other words, if you have a lot of rainfall, that's going to create more plants and trees, which will cover up the sand dunes and prevent them from moving. But if it's a really hot, dry desert with minimal precipitation, the wind's going to pick up and it's just going to keep blowing those sand dunes around as time goes on. With all this in mind, I think it's safe to say that the basalt features we see in the Skylands really haven't changed much since they were formed about 10,000 years ago. However, the sand dunes likely have shifted quite a bit, because if it's been hot and dry, the wind can really shape them much more. Now that we've established that the Skyblands have been fairly desert-like since those great floods came through the area, we can move on with our investigation. And I thought we'd take a look next at West Bar. This is a massive current ripple that was created during the Younger Dryas, as the ice sheets were melting down up north. And we've all seen current ripples like this before, but usually they're only a few centimeters high. Now, though, these current ripples are on a much larger scale. And there's two reasons why I'm showing you these ripples today. The first is that they prove megascale floods came through this area, and they left these features behind. The second is that they are still perfectly preserved. In other words, there really hasn't been much erosion since they formed roughly 10 to 12,000 years ago. That's critical. We also see similar current ripples over in western Montana at Camas Prairie. This is another landscape that shows the scars of the megascale floods, but it really hasn't seen much appreciable erosion since they were formed. Again, the key takeaway here is that these current ripples are still visible even after 10,000 years. Let's head back to Moses Lake next, and this is another area that Randall focused on in our video, which again, I recommend you go watch that if you want to learn more. And basically what Randall is saying is that these sand dunes appear to have fluvial shapes formed by water. But that brings us to the main debate of this video. Are they formed by wind, water, or maybe both? Well, this is where the historical imagery tool in Google Earth will help us figure that out. I've already gone ahead and taken screenshots of various regions around the world, and that's going to show us the difference over a span of roughly 40 years, or sometimes much less. And when we do this comparison for Moses Lake, we see that the sand dunes are indeed shifting very slightly over that span of time. Therefore, 
one would logically conclude that the patterns we see here are formed by wind over long periods of time, especially when we consider that it's been pretty hot and dry since the end of the Younger Dryas. As we discussed before, if a region is hotter and drier with minimal rainfall, there's going to be less vegetation. With minimal or no vegetation on the dunes, the sand can reshape them much easier. On the other hand, if those dunes are covered in plants, they're really not going to move much at all. With all that out of the way, let's consider what we're looking at here. I think it's entirely possible that this sand was deposited as the floodwaters slowed down and then dropped the sand over this region. Then the final flows of water shaped the dunes similar to what we see today. Finally, over the last 10,000 years or so, the wind has continued to shape the dunes, but it really hasn't altered them all that much. If that seems hard to believe, well then you might be surprised to hear that the mainstream science has actually confirmed that very idea. As we see here in this geological article, the various sand dune fields found in Washington were formed from alluvial sediments derived from the Missoula floods. And then it goes on to say that other extensive sand deposits are also likely the result of the glacial outburst floods. So there it is. We now have confirmation that the sand dunes, at least some of the ones here in the Scablands, were created during the floods at the end of the Ice Age. And that's going to be really important for the rest of today's video, because now we have a clear-cut example where we know that the sand was deposited after large floods. For those that might have seen my first video in this catastrophe series, you'll know I don't really buy into the Missoula floods that was referenced earlier. And that's because that theory relies on a single ice dam up in Idaho repeatedly forming and then failing over 40 times in just 2,000 years. To put that another way, that means every 50 years you have an ice dam failure leading to a catastrophic flooding from Glacial Lake Missoula all over the Scablands. And when you really start to think about it, the physics of that really don't make a lot of sense. And that's why in my first video in the series I talked about Randall Carlson's hypothesis where he says that potentially a series of comet bombardments on the Cordilleran ice sheet was mainly responsible for the Scablands. To me, that makes a lot more sense. Regardless of what you believe though, it's nice to finally see that both sides can agree on one thing, and that is that these sand dunes we see in the Scablands were created during the floods. Alright, let's head further south now to the Hanford Dunes along the Columbia River. When I first saw these in Google Earth, I got really excited because it fit right into my theory. And the best way to visualize this is with the National Map Viewer, which is something we covered in the first video in this series. As you can see with the tinted hillshade overlay, this entire area was scoured out as the ice sheets were melting, and it formed this channel which you can still kind of see today. No doubt lots of sand and sediment were flowing out through this channel as the floods progressed. And I can just almost visualize a large river flowing through here, depositing all that sand on the far side of the Columbia where it's been ever since. But this brings us to the wind versus water debate again. Because are these shapes we're seeing here caused by those last flows of water? Or is that caused by the wind over the last 10,000 years? It's hard to say, but I would probably say that the overall structure and size hasn't changed too much since those floods came through the area. Although, if you have 10,000 years, I'm sure the wind has done quite a bit to reshape the dunes. If we head over to the east, we have another dune field called Juniper Dunes. These were also referenced in that paper that concluded they were formed from the floods. There's plenty of other smaller dune fields here in the Scablands, but there's one final one I want to look at, and it's located near Boardman, Oregon. I actually just stumbled on this one a few days ago as I was driving home from Utah, and with the help of Google Earth's historical imagery tool, we can clearly see that this dune has migrated over the past few years. So obviously, wind is the main factor here. If I zoom out a bit, you'll see there's a nearby airport, and the runway lines up almost perfectly with a sand dune. In case you didn't know, when they're building these airports and runways, they spend years collecting data on the prevailing winds. Because if you're flying an airplane, you need to take off into the wind. And this can be a very useful tool if you're trying to determine the wind direction on Google Earth. All you have to do is look for a nearby airport and look which way the runways are going. That at least gives you a rough idea of which way the wind is blowing as well. Before we move on to our next destination, let's recap what we've learned so far. The Scablands show clear signs of massive erosion as the Cordilleran ice sheet catastrophically melted 
between about 12,800 and 10,000 years ago. Most of these erosional features, like the current ripples, the potholes, the recessional cataracts, etc., are all still perfectly preserved. That's mainly due to the fact that these features are in solid basalt and because it's been a desert environment. Wind really isn't going to have that much of an effect on them. However, the sand dunes are much more susceptible to the wind, especially when the climate is hot and dry. Therefore, based on everything we've learned today, I think it's safe to say that the original sand was laid down at the end of the floods and shaped to some extent by the last of those flood waters. And then since those events, they have been shaped to some extent by the wind, which brings me to another important point I needed to make today. In this paper on the white sand dunes, they flat out say right here that little research has taken place in sand-covered desert areas. And the difficulty of getting a macro-scale view of the sand seas have all contributed to the lack of knowledge of the movement and accumulation of sand in deserts. This is why I was so excited to create this video, because with the help of Google Earth and the historical imagery, we can now do our own research from the comfort of our homes. So for the first time in history, the average person can now study the planet on a grand scale. And this gives us a whole new perspective. Rather than a few scientists focusing on one small area around the world, now we can take what they've done, look at maps, and actually see the planet in real time. Or we can even go back in time roughly 40 years, thanks to the satellite data. And now we can start to piece together the story of our planet. And if you think about it, Nobody is going to be very excited to travel out to the middle of these sand dunes. It's very difficult to do, and frankly, it's just not feasible in a lot of places. So I would say there's no harm in asking questions and speculating like we're doing today, because at least this will get some ideas out there, which we can further work upon. Let's move on now to the Nebraska sand hills. You might not have heard of these. I know I hadn't until I began doing research for this video, but these are actually the largest dune field in the Western Hemisphere. After digging into some geological papers, I found a few interesting discoveries. As we see here, the sand dunes appear to have developed in the late Pleistocene. A date of 12,600 years ago was obtained for the sediments and is the oldest dated material in the sand hills. There's that date again. So far, every dune field we've looked at in North America can be tied back to the end of the Ice Age, which further supports my hypothesis that many of the sand deserts around the world may have their origin in that catastrophic transition from glacial to interglacial, which took place roughly 12 to 10,000 years ago. In this case, for the Nebraska Sandhills, we know that there were immense floods of meltwater coming down from Canada as the Laurentide ice sheet was melting. And with the help of the National Map Viewer, we can pretty clearly see where most of those floodwaters went, which in this case is towards the east. However, it is possible that some of those floodwaters could have washed over the region and created the Nebraska Sandhills, just like we saw in the Scablands. And there is some other data out there that seems to back up that idea. And if you want to do some research on your own, again, I will have links to all the documents down below. So I'd recommend you check those out after the video. Let's head over next to the White Sands of New Mexico. This is a very interesting location that I'm looking forward to visiting one day in the future. As we zoom in here, right away we see some pretty familiar features. My initial impression of this region was that you had a large sheet flood racing from the east to the west, depositing most of that sand, and creating these patterns we see. However, after doing some more research, that idea really doesn't hold up that well. For example, if we use the historical imagery tool, we can see that the sand dunes shift quite a bit, and that's most likely due to the wind. I thought it was interesting though, that in this article they say that during the wetter conditions of the Pleistocene epoch, which again was the end of the Ice Age, you had this entire region was basically a pluvial lake, which is a lake caused by rainfall. And that's ultimately what was responsible for all the sand and the salt and everything else ending up in this valley. And if we scroll down further in the article, we can see that the winds are actually coming from the southwest which is the opposite of what I would have thought as a layman. And if we use the historical imagery tool in Google Earth, we see exactly that. The sand is shifting from west to east due to the wind. However, it's not necessarily a clear-cut example of wind or water. And this leads us to another thing we have to consider 
in our debate today is how does water affect the sand dunes? As we scroll down in the article, we see here that there's two basic mechanisms that control essentially the wind transport of the sand, cohesion and cementation. Cohesion is where damp sand forms clumps and sticks together and it becomes too large and heavy for the wind to move. It goes on to say that cementation also reduces the amount of loose sand available for transport. And this is important to understand because that shows us that if there's more rainfall, even if there's not necessarily vegetation, the fact that the sand is denser and heavier and clumping together means that the wind really can't move it as much as it normally would be able to. Looking at another geological paper on the white sand dunes, we see here that the timing of the formation lines up very well with the end of the ice age again. That's starting to become a common theme. Before we move on, I thought we'd briefly touch on the footprints which have been found in the white sands. These have now been dated to about 23,000 years old. And for those of us that are into archaeology, that's fascinating. Because for years, we were told that humans first arrived in the Americas roughly 13,000 years ago. And that's where they say that we crossed over the Bering Land Bridge, down through Canada between the Gap and the Ice Sheets, and then down into what is today the United States. But now we have another piece of evidence that proves that that whole Clovis first hypothesis was completely wrong. And as it says here in this article, the human footprints were found alongside giant sloths, camels, and mammoths. And if we continue on here, it says that in many cases, interactions between humans and animals seems peaceful. That's really fascinating. I mean, just think about what it might have been like back then. You'd be out there wandering around the edge of the lake shore, surrounded by these massive animals, which today are extinct. And it seems like most people have no idea just how many different species of megafauna were living in North America just 10 or 15,000 years ago. While some of those species may have been docile, like the camels and the sloths and things like that, there were quite a few that were much more aggressive, including the giant cave bears, the dire wolves, and much more. So if you were a hunter-gatherer living in America during the Ice Age, it would have been a much more dangerous time. The reason I brought that up is because I'm planning on creating a whole new series that looks into these various myths from around the world. And I think what we'll find is that these myths are actually real stories that have been passed down orally for generations, especially the tales of the Native Americans. And I'm really looking forward to sharing some of those stories with you in the coming months because they give a very interesting picture of what might have happened to our species over the last 100,000 years. And I'd bet that some of these stories are going to tie in perfectly with what Randall Carlson has been teasing lately over on his YouTube channel. Anyway, let's get back on track, and our next destination is the coast of Brazil, where we have some really beautiful sand dunes. And based on our historical satellite data, we can very easily see that these sand dunes have moved quite a bit over the last 40 years. This is interesting, because out of all the sand dunes I've studied around the world, these are by far the most dynamic. Because these sand dunes are located right along the coast, I think it's pretty safe to say that they're mainly moving due to the wind. Although I will mention that these sand dunes in particular have a really interesting phenomena where they fill up with water. So again, water does play a role in the formation and the movement of the sand dunes. Let's now jump across South America to the Peruvian coast where we see similar patterns all up and down the coast. And my initial impression of these was that they were created by a tsunami or a series of tsunamis over time. But after some further research, I realized I probably wasn't completely right, because if we zoom in here to these Barkhan dunes, and we use our historical imagery, the dunes are shifting quite substantially just by the wind over the last few years. And this is why this historical imagery tool is so important, because I was able to debunk my own hypothesis just by looking at some photos. I could spend another few hours looking at dune fields all across the world, but in the interest of time, I think we'll finish up today in the Sahara Desert. From this vantage point, we can see that there appears to be large channels carved by massive floods, mainly coming from Libya down into Chad. And oddly enough, we even have evidence that there was a large lake here called Lake Megachad. Yes, really. And if we zoom into the modern day Lake Chad, we can see some familiar shapes. Some look very similar to the Nebraska sand dunes we saw earlier, 
while others are more reminiscent of the current ripples we saw in the Scablands. From this vantage point, you can almost imagine the water just pouring down through the Sahara and leaving behind the formations we see today, which obviously have been modified to some extent by wind, but still, I think it's possible that a lot of these underlying formations were caused by water at some point in the past. While we're on the topic of current ripples, let's take a quick detour to Mauritania. This is another area that Randall discussed in our video. And again, we see what appears to be a very large set of current ripples all throughout the region. Although if we use the historical imagery tool, we do see that these sand dunes are shifting to some degree due to the wind. And that makes sense because we know for a fact that wind does play a large role in shaping the modern day Sahara. I'm sure some of you are familiar with those large dust clouds that flow from the Sahara all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to Florida usually. So clearly, wind is having a big effect. We even see some more of these Barkan dunes over in the Sahara Desert, which are moving just like the dunes we saw over on the Peruvian coast. But getting back to those current ripples, if that's actually what they are, these are on a much, much larger scale than the ones we saw in the Scablands. What kind of force would have taken to create these and where would that water have come from? Some have theorized that a large influx of water into the Mediterranean Ocean could have overtopped northern Africa and then flowed down to modern day Lake Chad. Others might say that a pull shift caused the entire earth to shift around and the water would have just came flowing up through Africa and then eventually washing back out as a tsunami. Another possibility is that you had a comet or pieces of a comet impacting into the Atlantic Ocean, which again would cause large tsunamis that come up into Africa and then wash back out. More importantly though, if you did have a comet impact into the ocean, a lot of that ocean water would be instantly vaporized and then it would go up into the atmosphere and begin to rain out, probably over Africa. And if it started to rain for 40 days and 40 nights, that could very easily cause all of Northern Africa to be washed away and left with what we see here. If all that sounds completely preposterous, remember, most of the sand dunes that we looked at today were created in some sort of flood. Or at the very least, the sand dunes were formed after a lake dried up. And if we were to spend even more time today looking at sand dunes from across the world, I think that would be the common story. Is that a lot of these sand dunes are originally formed to some extent by water and then modified by wind during the Holocene. Our final destination today is over in Saudi Arabia because from this vantage point, it almost looks like the region was scoured by floods, similar to what we saw in the Sahara. And as we zoom in, we'll find some very interesting sand patterns that stretch across the entire region. Interestingly enough, if we use our historical imagery, a lot of these sand dunes haven't moved much, if at all, in the last 40 years. And you would think that if these winds are so intense in this area, that these sand dunes would shift to some degree in 40 years, but I'm not seeing much of a change at all. So I'm not really sure what to make of that, to be honest. The dunes we're looking at here are called linear dunes, and those are usually believed to form when wind is blowing equally from both sides. Although in their own research papers, the scientists say that their origin is controversial and the exact wind mechanisms are uncertain. This same article goes on to mention some linear dunes that were studied in Iran, and so I did some scouting in Google Earth and found these interesting dunes. But I'm not quite sure if these are the ones they were talking about or not. Still, they're pretty interesting to look at. Let's zoom back out over Saudi Arabia again, and I'll explain my hypothesis on how this area was formed. I would argue that a large flood scoured this landscape at some point in the past, going from north to south. And this might have happened as recently as 15,000 years ago, as our planet was catastrophically changing from that glacial to our modern day interglacial climate. These floods also deposited all of the sand that we see today. And in the warm, dry Holocene over the last 10,000 years, the sand has blown around quite a bit, but the wind is not gonna be powerful enough to deposit all this sand. I would think you would need a lot of water to do that. So if we think back to some of the sand dunes we've studied today, especially those in the Scablands, the researchers admit that almost every single one of them was formed during the floods of the Younger Dryas. There's still so much to talk about, but I think we've gone on long enough today. Before we go, I just wanna reiterate some final points because this entire debate really boils down to the two schools of thought in geology, catastrophism 
and uniformitarianism. A uniformitarianist would likely conclude that everything we've seen today was ultimately created by wind and was formed slowly over thousands, maybe even millions of years, as they say, one grain of sand at a time. On the other hand, a catastrophist might conclude that the formation of these sand dunes happened very quickly due to catastrophic flooding. These large floods could have easily moved large amounts of sand to their present location. Then, after the floodwaters receded, slow, incremental wind erosion took place and has persisted to this day. I think the perfect example of this is what we saw in Florida with Hurricane Ian a few months ago. We had really intense winds, storm surge, rains, and more. And in the span of just a few hours, there was more erosion and destruction than has been seen in years. But then the next day, the sun was out and shining. I think this perfectly explains the catastrophist point of view. You have short, intense periods of change and erosion, which is then followed by long periods of calm weather, which lasts for the majority of the time. And if we extrapolate that idea upwards, everything starts to make sense. We know that the Earth passed through a major cataclysm roughly 12,000 years ago. This was responsible for the deaths of most of the megafauna here on Earth. There is also extreme erosion that we still see remnants of all around the planet. There was over a 400-foot increase in sea level in a relatively short amount of time. The ice sheets, which covered all of Canada and up to two miles thick of ice, melted very quickly and then began to flood out over North America and much more. So I think it's entirely possible that many of the sand dunes found around the world were formed in catastrophic scenarios with large floods. And in fact, a lot of them may have formed during the most recent transition from glacial to interglacial. It seems you need a lot of water to move these large amounts of sand. And that's all I've got for you today. We really just scratched the surface, but we've also gone on long enough. I think I've shown pretty clearly today that we have a mixture of both wind and water that's responsible for all the sand dunes we see around the world. Don't forget, you can download all the documents and photos using the link in the video description below. I'd also recommend you spend some time on your own using Google Earth's historical imagery tool to see how the Earth has changed since those initial photos were taken in the 1980s. If you enjoyed today's topic, don't forget to check out some of the other videos in this catastrophe series. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.